Thank you, Dee. And uh, thank you for organizing this, uh, this uh, event. I am very grateful that you invited me to speak. And I'm very grateful to all of you who tuned in to hear me uh, speak. Um, I hope you've uh, had a chance to read my pamphlet, uh, Voices for Health and uh, Brothers and Sisters in the Struggle, 60 Million Rural Americans, and um, that you'll make use of it, that you'll uh, share it with uh, friends and coworkers and comrades, and uh, that it will be a part of your work. Uh, um, so uh, this war, this pamphlet is a, is a result of uh, many rich discussions in the party's uh, political action commission chaired by Joel Fishman. And um, we, uh, it was such a rich discussion and we drew such uh, strong conclusions from it that we decided that we, we needed a subcommittee on rural and farm and rural affairs, um, which is chaired by Mark Fromke of Minnesota. And um, we are paying at much attention to this, this uh, question of uh, rural America. Uh, I just want to say a few things about my background. I grew up on a dairy farm here in Clallam County from, I'm speaking from my home on our family farm, uh, outside of Squim, Washington. Um, my parents uh, bought a dairy farm here in 1948 when my father was blacklisted and couldn't find work elsewhere. Uh, but we were very lucky to settle in Clallam County because it turned out that there was a very strong uh, local communist party in uh, Clallam County uh, chaired by Vivian Gabry. Um, her son, uh, Fred Gabry, was uh, a co-worker of mine, uh, very close, uh, we worked very closely together um, on the staff of the People's Weekly World uh, back in the uh, 90s and uh, turn of the century. Um, so, um, yeah, um, it's been a very, um, rich experience. I, I grew up on the farm, um, milking uh, cows twice a day, um, and learned so much about uh, rural America. And uh, it's never left me. I've always uh, uh, had the strong feelings about uh, farmers and uh, rural folks in general and the struggles that they, they wage. Um, my mom handed me the Communist Manifesto when I was 13 years old. I read it beginning to end, uh, avidly. And uh, when I was uh, 19, in 1959, Vivian Gabry recruited me to the Communist Party. We were at the Clallam County Fair, uh, staffing our peace booth um, there surrounded by a lot of cows and pigs and chickens and farmers. Um, so it's uh, very deep in my, uh, my background, uh, a love of uh, rural America and a love of the people here, the 60 million people who reside in, uh, in our rural uh, regions of the, of the country. And I served as a writer and editor of the People's World for uh, many years. My whole working life was as a, a journalist for the uh, uh, Daily, well, it was the Worker, then the Daily World, and finally the People's Weekly World. So um, that's my background. And um, I would hope that uh, all of you will uh, think about some questions that I have for you. Uh, and, and just think about it for when the comment period begins. Do you have any uh, farm in your background? Maybe you grew up on a farm. Maybe your parents or grandparents grew up on a farm. Um, 
what is your concept of rural America? Uh, do you think it's a region of wealth, affluence? Do you think rural America is a stable a part of our country? Um, or do you think rural America is afflicted with the same deep political and economic crisis that the rest of the country is suffering? And if you have ideas about that, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Um, if it's afflicted with crisis, is it a different crisis than uh, elsewhere in the country? Maybe it's deeper. Maybe there are problems here that are not so acute elsewhere in the country and in, in the cities and in the suburbs. So uh, be prepared to talk about this uh, when, when you have a chance to speak. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I have some points that I'd like to make about rural America. Um, we are dominated in the countryside by corporate agribusiness, giant corporations, and they have been eating up and swallowing up family farmers for uh, a century now. There used to be 7 million farmers in the United States. Now it's down to 2 million. Um, a 2018 report by the National Farmers Union revealed that farmers receive less than 15 cents for every dollar spent on food. And that's a decline of 5% from the year before, 2017. An example, a loaf of bread that you pay $3.49 for at the supermarket, what do you think is the farmer's share of that $3.49? 12 cents, less than 1% of the the cost of that loaf of bread is the share that the farmer receives. My family is an example. When we started out farming in 1948, we milked 25 cows. We barely broke even. 20 years later, we were milking 100 cows twice a day. Every day we shipped a ton of milk, 300 gallons, by tanker truck to Seattle. We still just broke even. My parents retired from farming in 1968. They did not go bankrupt because we were breaking even. But that is all, zero profits for dawn to dark toil, producing enough milk to feed a small city like my hometown, Squim, population 7,000, zero pop profits. We were subsidizing food with our labor. U.S. agriculture is fabulously productive, often called the breadbasket of the world. Each of the 2 million farmers in the U.S. produces enough food to feed 166 people. In 1960, each U.S. farmer produced enough to feed 26 people. Think of that growth in productivity, that enormous rise in the output for every hour that workers, uh, that farmers toil on the land. It's a little misleading because the millions of farmers driven off their farms have been replaced by millions of landless farm workers who toil for low wages, many of them immigrants or migrants from Mexico or Central America. They work on giant agribusiness factory farms, organizing these farm workers and rural workers into unions is an urgent necessity to turn rural America around. 
The U.S. Department of Agriculture lumps forestry, fishing, textile, and food services together with farm production. In total, this sector added $1 trillion to the U.S. gross domestic product in 2016. And that does not include other rural-based industries, coal, oil and natural gas, copper, aluminum, iron, and other hard rock mining. And many manufacturing enterprises have moved into rural areas, uh, seeking cheap, unorganized labor is the main motive for it. Their move into the South, for example, they often chose rural areas to put their factories. All these industries are in crisis, aggravated now deeply by COVID-19. During Donald Trump's disastrous presidency, 200,000 farmers, nearly 10%, went out of business. Many of them went bankrupt. Especially at risk are African-American farmers, targets for racist discrimination for a century or more, denied access to U.S. Department of Agriculture farm loans that assist uh, family farmers. I have written articles for the People's World about the fight back by black farmers, Latino farmers, and other people of color to win their share of these benefits. Trump's trade war with China has deepened the crisis uh, in uh, rural America. The tariffs he clamped on imports from China triggered a retaliation by China, causing a 75% reduction in U.S. exports to China and similar reductions of other crops. Exports to China, $24 billion in 2014, fell to $9.1 billion in the following year. Trump attempted to make up for this huge deficit in the, uh, <clears throat> uh, by ordering the Department of Agriculture Commodity Credit Corporation to pay $45 billion in bailouts. But Forbes magazine reported that the hog share of this bailout went to, and I quote from Forbes, wealthy farms and well-connected corporations while providing little relief for the neediest farmers and ranchers. It is estimated, continuing the quote, for the, <clears throat> that a staggering 40% of farm sector income that year will come from, this year will come from government subsidies, end of quote. In other words, welfare, for corporate agribusiness. The 60 million rural Americans are afflicted with a crisis in every part of their daily lives. A lack of jobs that pay livable wages. Most of those workers non-union, without medical insurance or any other benefits. Minimum wage jobs. And you can imagine trying to make it on a $7.25 an hour minimum wage. You can't, you have to have more than one job. There is a crisis of unaffordable housing, rising homelessness, including right here in Clallam County, where people are, are sleeping out in the woods in tents because there's no affordable housing for them. Lack of health care, sharp cutbacks in public education, a crumbling infrastructure. So, the, oh, a general crisis for people living in rural America. And yet the right wing focuses on rural America and is working to turn it into a reliable base for the ultra right throughout the United States. They have con cunningly strategized on the biggest trick of all, convincing people to vote against their own self-interest. 
Trump, for example, he's a disaster for farmers, and yet many voted for him. Nothing dramatizes this blindness more clearly than people turning against measures urgently needed to combat COVID-19. These white supremacist Republicans have tricked millions of people into risking death or actually dying rather than receive a vaccination. The majority of the anti-vax cult is centered in rural America. In many parts of rural America, armed, vigilante, armed vigilantism, including right here in Clallam County, has surged. It has been a scourge for centuries. Think of the Ku Klux Klan, Knight Riders, enforcing white supremacy through lynchings across the South and beyond. Today, these domestic terrorists have reappeared. They seized on Trump's opposition to COVID-19 protective measures to terrorize the Michigan legislature, threatening to kidnap and assassinate Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Armed to the teeth with assault rifles, glocks, pipe bombs, and other deadly paraphernalia, they attacked the U.S. Capitol killing and wounding hundreds in their coup attempt January 6th. There is a definite fascist tendency in the rise of armed militias and tactics of armed terror, most of it centered in rural America. Again, the driving ideology of these fascist elements is white supremacy, hatred of African Americans and other people of color, immigrants, refugees, Muslims, Jewish people. These fascist elements also rely on red baiting, anti-communism, anti-socialism to whip up fear and hate. We should remember Georgi Dimitrov's definition of fascism, the open terrorist dictatorship of the most reactionary, warlike, chauvinist section of finance capital. It's as true today as it was when he said those words in his call for the United Front to fight fascism. Last year, here in Clallam County, we helped organize a Black Lives Matter vigil on the same day that millions of people marched for, to protest the murder of George Floyd. Nearly 500 people mostly youth turned out and squim, made me very proud. The local gun shop owner, Seth Larson, summoned a dozen fellow gun owners who descended on our vigil with assault rifles. Larson strutted up to Courtney Thomas, the young woman who organized the vigil. Where is Antifa? He demanded. Courtney told him, these are local people, a peaceful vigil. I know why you are here, to intimidate us. We are not intimidated. Larson slunk off with his fellow uh, gun thugs. Meanwhile, out in Fork, 70 miles west of here, gun thugs terrorized a multiracial family on a camping trip, they'd come over from Spokane. Are you Antifa? The gun thugs demanded. All night long, these gun thugs fired their guns in the air near the family's campsite, cut down trees across their escape route, and so terrorized the family that Clallam County Sheriff's deputies escorted the family out of the county for their safety. We joined a vigil by the Ho tribe in Forks to protest this domestic terrorism, but no one was arrested for this open act of racist terror. Despite their defeat January 6th in the abortive attack on the US Capitol, these elements have not given up. 
Their aim is to strip millions of their right to vote, especially African Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, and other people of color, to block every positive initiative by the Biden administration and to win or steal the 2022 midterm elections. This will prepare the ground for them to seize the White House back in, in 2024. I want to conclude with comments about our struggles here in Clallam County. Why? Because in many ways, Clallam County is a microcosm of rural America as a whole. We initiated, we initiated Voices for Health and Healing two years ago in support of the Jamestown Sklallam tribe when they announced plans to build a MAP clinic in Squim for treatment of victims of OxyContin and other opiates. The Republican right formed Save Our Squim, SOS. They whipped up racism against the tribe and fear of people who are addicted or homeless or poor. They shouted that Squim is going to be overrun with homeless people from Seattle, bust in here for treatment at this clinic. But we fought back. We organized mass meetings and vigils and other action in support of the tribe and in support of this clinic. The clinic is nearly finished and it will open early next year. All of the attempts by the racist elements of SOS to block construction of the clinic were defeated. Yet the racist incitements against the tribe continue they also target officials like our North Olympic Peninsula Public Health Officer, Dr. Allison Berry, for ordering restaurants to require patrons to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Dr. Berry is the most beloved health leader in Clallam County, where she has helped organize vaccinations for over 60% of county residents. Yet the, the anti-vax fanatics have threatened her with bodily harm, staged mass marches on what they thought was her home. Turned out she, had moved, she and her infant child had moved away long ago. They stormed the county courthouse in Port Angeles and were blocked by the sheriff's deputies. Uh, this was modeled on the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Now we are mobilizing to win the November 2nd election. We have a slate of five wonderful candidates running for Swim City Council to oust what we call the Gang of Four, the appointed, not elected, right-wing Republicans who vote in lockstep with our QAnon mayor, William Armacost. Imagine that. In a public meeting, he announced that QAnon is a truth movement, and he called on people to watch a video about QAnon and maybe join it like he did. The gang just pushed through on a narrow four to three vote, a resolution stating that they will not enforce Dr. Barry's COVID-19 mandate and agreeing with the anti-vaxxers that mandatory vaccinations are, quote, unconstitutional, a brazen lie. To support our candidates countywide, we have held street corner waves, including one yesterday in Squim, with nearly 100 people there, in Squim and Port Angeles for six weeks. Among our signs are placards with the message, thank you, Dr. Barry, for saving lives. We are greeted by motorists with honking car horns and thumbs up salutes. We have gone door to door canvassing. We sent out postcards and we have phone banked. It all depends on getting out the vote. We can win 
every single precinct in SQUIM voted in a majority for Biden-Harris. So how did a QAnon creep crazy get into the SQUIM City Hall? Because we were asleep at the switch. We were not doing the work that we should have been doing. We took for granted that the moderate folks who had always uh, governed SQUIM would continue to govern SQUIM. No, it isn't so. Now it's governed by rabid white supremacists, armed vigilante types, QAnon types. The answer is multiracial grassroots coalition. Speaking out, action in the streets, it all depends now on getting out the vote. And it will depend on that in 2022 and 2024. Our challenge is to get out the votes, and that means especially in rural parts of our country. We must organize in every rural community. We must not write them off. We know that these people are afflicted by crisis. They need our help. They're calling for us. They are our brothers and sisters. We must go and help them and organize with them. We think our grassroots efforts here in Clallam County offer lessons in how to work. We have built that coalition, that grassroots coalition. It includes so many different diverse elements like Indivisible Squim, Move On, uh, the tribes, the Jamestown Clallam tribes. When we have a vigil in the center of Squim, there is Vicki Lowe. She's a descendant of the Jamestown Squallam tribe. She pushed through a resolution in the city council against white supremacy. That's Vicki Lowe, descendant of the Jamestown Squallam tribe. She is a candidate for um, Squim City Council. We are supporting her all out and four other wonderful candidates like her in this slate. So, we can, this is a battle we can win in rural America. We've got to recognize that they are folks like us who are afflicted by the same crisis that all the rest of us are afflicted by. We have to reach out to them, see them as our brothers and sisters, and uh, help pull them into this uh, coalition that we have for democracy and for all the things that we uh, treasure. Thank you. Okay, Tim, uh, thank you. We'll open the floor now for, uh, for uh, questions and comments. Again, uh, please uh, be willing to verbalize your question or comment. Please click the picture of the hand on your control um, panel. If you'd like to speak, um, please be succinct and we will uh, be able to scroll through and open your mic. We will not be able to read written questions. Please be willing to uh, introduce. Uh... Okay, Larry, your mic is open. Larry, there you are. Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Larry Allen. I'm a, I'm a truck driver. Uh, and. Uh, so a lot of my family, I'm, I'm from the South, and a lot of my family are rural Americans. Uh, but a lot of the time when you see like socialists organizing or communists organizing in any regard, it's always the police that try to stop them. Like we had uh, something in Valdosta where like a, a Black Lives Matter movement happened, but the police will attempt to suppress it. And then, like you see, like rural America, like the like the police will like empower like these neo Nazis and neo fascists. Like, how do you get around that, or how do you like try to stop like you know police officers who themselves are you know a, a problem of our system from stopping organization? I, I, no, if you can hear me. I'm I'm I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm raring to go to answer that question, but do other people have questions before I answer this well, one? Well, go on, Tim. Go on, Tim, and then That's we'll. 
very, very central and wonderful question. Um, and yes, we've faced that here in Clallam County, attempts to intimidate us and silence us. For certainly uh, the uh, campaign to uh, silence Dr. Barry and to get her fired is an example. And we are fortunate that Dr. Barry is a courageous woman who has stood her ground and has not been intimidated. Um, I do think that, and I, I myself have been red baited. They, they, they were hoping that by uh, naming me as a public way, publicly well-known uh, communist who is very, very active in all of these, these uh, rural battles, uh, that if they red baited, that, that we would all crawl under the closest uh, uh, rug and hide. It hasn't happened. People are fighting back. They're ready to fight. And they embrace me. They welcome me. Uh, they certainly support Dr. Barry. And they're coming to the defense of everyone who is targeted for intimidation. But you're right. Uh, one of the reasons that we're lucky here is that Clallam County is, is a, a bellwether county. It's the most reliable bellwether county in the nation in the presidential elections. We always uh, are, go back and forth. I mean, Trump won narrowly in Clallam County, but so did Obama win in Clallam County, narrowly. Obama carried Clallam County by 41 votes in 2012. And we think we were a factor, including my wife, Joyce, who went door to door to turn out the vote. And we think our efforts were a factor in getting out that 41 votes that Obama needed to win. So we're lucky that we have that kind of a close thing. And I think uh, folks in uh, parts of the South are, I think they are really heroic for standing up in the face of uh, a far more one-sided, uh, uh, right-wing dominated uh, uh, situation than we face here in Clallam County. But uh, Larry, I think the key is finding the people who are ready to fight back. And in often the cases in the South, of course, it is African-Americans who are fighting back and they have a record of fighting back seeking alliances with African-American people. Women, they are targeted for uh, this vicious uh, drive to uh, overturn Roe v. Wade, which has been the law of the land since 1973. Uh, women are courageous and taking a stand. Seek out alliances with them. And it's happening, look at Georgia. You think Stacey Abrams and John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock and those folks in, in Georgia who are turning a state that was once reliable, re reliably red into purple and soon hopefully turning it blue. So um, that's the key, finding allies. And uh, also I think uh, fashioning your message um, in a way that appeals in a broad way. Uh, don't be pulled into narrow uh, formulations, but nonviolent uh, resistance, uh, mass uh, efforts to defend the rights of African Americans and women. Uh, it's a winning strategy. Okay, Tim, we have another question. Cindy, we're opening your mic. Cindy, click your picture of your mic on your end. There you are. I'm, a, I'm unmuted. Hi, Tim, it's so great to hear your voice and Baltimore misses you. And my question has to do with this. Um, I w have been in the League of Women Voters and in, I believe it was 2014, the farm bill, the most recent farm bill went through. And I was part of the league's consensus question, which was, uh, what was the league's uh, stance going to be on different parts of the farm bill? But after that, we formed a small, and I say very small group of us formed an international agriculture group. So of course, the major issue in international agriculture is agroecology versus industrial agriculture. And, um, and also the only thing that I didn't hear you say tonight that I expected you to say was that there is a myth 
that the United States uh, feeds the world. And in fact, it only, uh, in terms of wheat and things like that, only uh, exports to about 15% of the world. It's not feeding the world, but farmers are fed that lie. But my question is, is there anybody, and I don't want to get away from the fight back. I know what you're talking about, and it's very important. But is there anybody who is who is building a fight back on family farmers being the future of food rather than industrial agriculture being the future of food? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Um, uh, you know, in our discussions in the uh, Political Action Commission, uh, we heard reports from Joe Henry in uh, Iowa, um, and he talked about the, the widespread nature of the struggles in, in the Midwest, like Iowa. Uh, by uh, farm workers at the uh, uh, food uh, at the meat packing plants in in Iowa, um, and um, uh, the the efforts by organic farmers to to uh, grow uh, vegetables, uh, the effort, the struggles against factory farming and uh, the defense of uh, uh, clean water and clean air. Uh, which is befouled by many of these factory farms. They just uh, make it practically impossible to live around uh, these uh, farms. So yes, there's a very uh, strong struggle in the Midwest. You know, one of the most dramatic ones was the, the struggle against the pipelines where the Native American Indian people came in with their allies, the environmental movement, to stop the construction of the XL um, a tar sands pipeline across sacred uh, lands of uh, North Dakota and uh, South Dakota, um, and uh, they they've won a victory on that. Uh, there's been uh, the Biden administration has canceled out on plans to build that count that pipeline. Um, but I just heard that uh, the corporation and it's a I think a Canadian based corporation is seeking billions of dollars in uh, payments for loss of expected profits from that. So it's not a, a struggle that's, uh, that's settled by any means. So yes, I think, and I think farmers are increasingly a part of these struggles. Uh, there's a National Farmers Union, the National Farmers Organization, there's uh, American Agriculture Movement, uh, and uh, Reverend Barber uh, and his Poor People's Campaign has built uh, uh, coalition relationships with uh, uh, farming farmer movements in uh, rural parts of the South and North Carolina and elsewhere. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a very very important part of uh, this uh, struggle to reach. The folks who are actually farmers uh, uh, on the land, you know, and it's 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 one thing to be a supporter in in the abstract of of these uh, folks. It's another thing to actually be the farmers yourselves and be part of the struggle. So that's a key. I agree. Okay. Uh, Mike Madden, your mic is open. Click the picture of you. There you are. Thank you. So, D, once again, thank you for, on a continuing basis, making available timely uh, comments and observations and resources. So, Brother Tim Wheeler, let me thank you from the Minnesota Dakotas, particularly the work that you and uh, our sister Helen uh, Kruth and Helvi Savol have done for a long time. I, I have to say that um, in Minnesota, both in the labor movement and in the uh, Democratic Party, uh, a uh, member who's a, uh, active in the farmers union said, you know what, the local Democratic Party ain't getting it. We're going to form a rural caucus. So I haven't yet, Tim, shared um, the this large file that is absolutely spot on 
both with the chair of that and local democratic forces. At the same time, um, you should note, Tim, that the issue that we're getting hammered, so the labor movement is figuring out, well, how do we lose CD1, CD6, CD7, and CD8? So they formed a group called um, Building Worker Power in Rural Minnesota, thinking the problem is geographic as opposed to ideological. So I just want you to be empowered. And um, our next conversation will say, well, are you doing something or not, Michael? So this is, um, you're, you're, you're on it, the main line, and we want to thank you and look to having ongoing conversations. But what you've done here in the report on rural America makes clear, what don't you understand about the nature of the crisis? Thank you much, Brother Tim Wheeler, and D for ongoing timely opportunities to get updated and find out uh, forces that work and possibilities, whatever our state is. Thank you very much, Tim, and thank you very much, uh, Sister Tim uh, D. Miles. Over now, bye-bye. Thank you so much, Mike. I very, very much appreciate uh, your comments. Uh, um, I knew Helen Kruth and uh, Helvi Savola and Lem Harris and other uh, folks who are working in uh, Minnesota um, and uh, in among farming uh, movements of uh, farmers and their communities. Yes, uh, uh, and right now, uh, Mark Fromke, uh, who's the chair of our subcommittee, uh, he's a leader of the AFL-CIO in Minnesota, and he has told us about his efforts to link up um, of the uh, delivery of food, of semi-truckloads of food organized by the AFL-CIO to rural communities. It really is a uh, irony, isn't it? that uh, the delivery of food to some of the richest agricultural uh, communities in our country, and yet hunger is a reality. So yeah, and uh, uh, I, your comments about the Democratic Party and efforts to, uh, you know, uh, get them off the dime on uh, uh, the struggle in rural uh, communities is absolutely first of uh, first importance because uh, we can't have a situation where we write people off. And that's a, a tendency, I think, in the Democratic Party to just say, okay, well, that's Republican territory. They, that's red territory. They did it in Washington state. They wrote off the entire communities east of the Cascade Mountains and kind of like handed it over to the Republicans. And now we're paying a huge price for it. We have to have a program of fighting for the interests of rural people. And thus it starts with affordable, uh, with uh, a living wage price for the commodities that they produce, you know, that they're receiving enough uh, for their produce that they can make a living. Rather than being earning below the cost of production, many farmers in this country are kept afloat by off-farm income. You think about that. Farmers that are not making it, they're losing their shirts in their farm production, so the wife or sometimes the husband uh, have to get a job in the city, you know, uh, driving a truck or, or whatever, to, to, to make ends meet and to keep the farm afloat. It's absolutely ridiculous. So um, I think that's a, 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 and you know, I'm active in the Democratic Party. I'm, I'm a member of the, I'm a trustee of the Clallam County Democratic Party. And I speak on these questions, but I'll tell you, we have a long way to go to get the part, the Democratic Party fully engaged in the fight to defend the interests of farmers uh, in our community. Okay, Tim. Neil Bose, your mic is open. You have to click the picture of the mic on your, there you are. Speak up, please. 
we your mic is open on your end and our end so uh but we don't hear you sorry try speak up please we don't hear you sorry Joe Henry, your mic is open. Click the picture of the mic on your control panel. Click the pit, use, there you are. Okay, I got it. I think yeah. I got it. Yeah. Okay. Hello, Tim. Amazing I'm discussion. Happy, Joe, I'm so happy you're on. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, thank you so much. And and I, I did want to get your input because you clearly have a historical perspective. I mean, clearly what we're seeing in the Midwest are young people, young people who come from generations of family farmers who want to re-engage in Nebraska, they have Regenerate Nebraska, is a group of young people in their 30s and 40s who want to connect, who want to go back to family farming. But it is difficult, as we all know, due to all the corporate farmers out there, uh, corporate farming, I should say because they're not individuals, they're corporations. Here we have uh, an administration that seems to be reaching out. Um, you know, clearly the party historically has been the switchboard operator to connect all the dots. What, what would be your approach as you see it historically on how these young people can put pressure on the Department of Agriculture to start providing programs to the many young people who want to farm, how would how would you suggest it uh, in in a party way? I think uh, there's a need for um, forms of direct subsidy for farmers for young people who want to go into agriculture, and there's no way we're going to do it without it. When my family went into farming in 1948, my parents had a $25,000 nest egg that they, my mother had inherited. And they used that $25,000 to buy a 53 acre farm with 25 cows that had a team of horses, no tractor. Um, and that was enough to get into farming, $25,000. You know how much it is now? It's upwards of 600,000 to 700,000 to get into agriculture and getting into a farm. So there's got to be an understanding that this is a value for our nation to have family farmers and there must be a program of subsidies to make it possible for uh, people to get into agriculture. You know, and a part of it is changing, you know, there are tens of billions of dollars spent by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Most of it is subsidies for factory farming, for the giant agribusiness. So part of it is demanding that that money that's actually being spent for the giant agribusiness be reprogrammed to help people who are in the um, you know, young people like you're talking about in their 30s and 40s. Incidentally, we have a, a young guy, Noah is his name, who is leasing our farm to produce vegetables, organic vegetables, and he is in his 30s. And he has a he has about 10 or so young people who have come from all over the country who were fired up by this idea of of uh, family farming and producing a quality local organic food for people. And uh, they're excited by it. And this is part of a movement that I think is going on all over the country. And we have to recognize them and connect with them and bring them into the movement and make their voices heard. I also have, con uh, uh, I've kind of lost them since I moved out here, but, um, I developed friendship with the African-American farmer in Georgia, and he knew all about the struggle by African-American farmers to win their share of the uh, tens of billions of dollars appropriated for agribusiness. 
and um, get it reprogrammed to help uh, black farmers. Okay. Bria, your mic is open. Please put your click your the picture of your mic with your mouse cursor on your control panel. Click the picture with your mouse cursor and it will open. Bria Becker. There you are. Brian Becker. I'm sorry. Brian. That's all right. That's all right. I uh I just moved here to uh El Paso, Texas. Uh, I hate to say the last part of the Texas on my uh, when I speak. I grew up in the New York City metro area, so I don't have all, any experience with rural uh, America and farming. Uh, you've given me insight. I uh, was a member of the Young Workers Liberation League back in the 1970s. I don't know if you heard of that or not. <laughs> uh, I and mean, we used to sell a daily world. It was called the daily world outside of uh, places. And uh, I took a few uh, blows to the head when they found out I was a uh, Marxist, you know, because people don't like that term. Uh, one of the things I, I, I try to focus on are the issues rather than the labels, you know, talk about the issues that are in hand. Right now I'm involved with Planned Parenthood uh, in an effort to try to restore reproductive rights in our in our in our area and uh and and but the state here is, is making it very impossible to do anything even to vote um probably the worst state in the country to live in uh, unfortunately i live in a very blue area which was just gerrymandered by the debt state cutting out one of our representatives even though our uh our popular 95% of the growth in the state is from Hispanic and, and non-white uh, people. Uh, racism is rampant uh, in Texas. Uh, what can I do to get more involved? I'm new back into the uh, movement. This is only my second webinar. I'm new back into it. I haven't, I've always been a Marxist, but I've never been able to uh, uh, practice very much. Uh, what can I do to get more involved? Thank you very much for sharing, too. I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Bria. Uh, and uh, yeah, I heard you say about the YWLL. Uh, my wife and I, uh, Joyce, were uh, at the founding convention of the YWLL in, in Chicago. So I, I know what you're saying. Uh, uh, it can be hard. and. Uh, uh, well, uh, you got to find folks that are your brothers and sisters and hopefully your comrades um, and work together with them and figure out a way to break through. Um, I, I'm not a, the, the best person to give advice to people who are uh, trying to organize in places like Texas. That's, I really admire. But, you know, we have a very, very active party organization in Texas. They are wonderful comrades down there. Uh, they are carrying on a very uh, wonderful, hard fight in a difficult situation. But you also got to realize that there are a lot of folks out there who are fighting back now. And there's no part of the country where there isn't fight back. This is a very universal situation. Uh, you know, you, it doesn't matter where you talk about, Arizona, Georgia, Florida, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Montana, there are people fighting back and you gotta join with them. But you know what I've found? Um, being a communist, working in a situation where there are the vast majority of the the folks that I work with are not are not Marxists, you know, not communists. They're wonderful people. But I have some ideas about how to move that they don't have. And one of them, you know, just grassroots activism. You have to be out in the public eye and get people out standing vigil, holding signs that support uh, Roe v. Wade and and uh, uh, the immigrant rights and uh, uh, affordable health care uh, out in public and 
be afraid to not be afraid to take some uh, knocks. And I guess you aren't afraid. You said you've taken a few. Well, I salute you for it. And uh, but I think this is a, a this is a positive situation for us. You know, it's true that the right wing is uh, uh, is uh, making a lot of noise. I don't think they represent the majority by any means. Uh, I think that, you know, that election last November where Biden and Harris ca captured 81 million votes and Trump got 74 million, a lot of votes, a lot of them in rural America, but there is fight back everywhere you look. And that includes in rural America. And I know El Paso, I mean, my God, we heard about, what's that member of Congress from El Paso who was running for president? Well, you know, he was riding on the support of a lot of Latino folks there in El Paso. I bet there's a strong movement in defense of immigrant rights in El Paso. Look them up and seek them out. Okay, uh, we'll take a, a two more. Uh, Allison, you just closed your mic. There you oh, are. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. I double clicked. Uh, Tim, I wanted to thank you for the clarity of of the the clarity with which you spoke on the crisis facing farming, uh, the the loss of land, the loss of uh, choice that people have and how they farm because their options are getting fewer and fewer to compete with this agribusiness um, on such a large scale. Uh, something that I think we need to also look at is the age of farmers is increasing. Um, succession planning is a really important part of that because if they don't have that in place, their land is going to go to the highest bidder and that's often the nearest agribusiness or a distant investor. So one thing I want to mention as a resource for people to look at is this organization called Manners that I just learned about and it is short for Minorities in Agriculture, Natural Resources and Related Sciences. Um, they have partners all across the country and they are doing a very clear job of addressing these legal concerns, scientific concerns of getting people into farming and especially the black, Asian, Latinx and indigenous farmers that have been disenfranchised over the last two centuries. Um, so it's M-A-N-R-R-S and I really encourage people to look up seeing if they're locally active because I've been very excited to learn about that recently. Thank you. So that was the thing, that was Go yeah. on, Allison. Oh, no, no, I was just, I, I wanted to say it, it was more of a comment than a question. I just wanted to share a resource. I know we're getting close to the end and I wanna thank you, Tim, for that wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I think uh, uh, seeking out and finding these uh, organizations is uh, very, very crucial um, and uh, developing uh, working relationships with them. Uh, uh, you know, even even in, like things like sending out my pamphlet, I've been sending it out to right here in Clallam County. I, <laughs> I've been sending it. And of course, they know me uh, in other ways as a leader of uh, Voices for Health and Healing and so on. But it, sending them this or handing it to them and talking about the issues in this pamphlet and the fact that it comes from the Communist Party kind of changes the nature of your conversation. One woman, dear friend, uh, she's fighting cancer now, Ellen is her name. She's just a dear, dear uh, person, a social worker. But I sent her a copy of it and she said, she called me back and she said, Tim, that's such a great pamphlet. Will you please send me 20 of them because I wanna send them out. And she did. And so who calls me? Robin, uh, uh, Betsy Robbins, the leader of the Democratic Party. Tim, I just read your pamphlet on rural America. It is wonderful. It is really great. I don't know how you do it, all these things you do. <laughs> oh, never underestimate our uh, power, folks. Uh, Joe Henry, who, that was one of the, his, uh, never underestimate our power as organizers. So use this, get it into the hands of people. Uh, uh, start the discussion about 
uh, this question that's on the mind. I know it's on the minds of a lot of people that we got to do something about rural America and finding ways to make farming affordable and uh, uh, possible. Instead of everyone leaving the farms, there's going to be people coming back and wanting to farm. We, we've got to help it and be initiators and fighters for it. You know, one of the big demands, I didn't mention it, but all during the years that I was on the Farm Commission, Lem Harris and others always stressed this, this issue 100% parity. It's a way of guaranteeing farmers a, a living profit, a, a narrow, a, a covering the cost of production and a, a profit enough that they can continue to live on the farm. And, and the uh, reactionary forces have always fought back against 100% uh, parity. And uh, it's still a, an important demand. And also programs that will help subsidize uh, people to get back into agriculture. Let's take one more question, Tim, before we end tonight. Anthony, your mic is open. There you are. Hi. Um, so yeah, thanks for the talk. It was uh, really informative and really great. I just have one question. Um, so you mentioned uh, in Clallam County and uh, also somebody else mentioned in Minnesota, coalitions with the Democratic Party, and you mentioned specifically running uh, and supporting five candidates. Um, are these uh, are these candidates on um, Communist Party line or um, or something else? Are you just supporting them in a coalition? And if not, do you think it's important uh, for the Communist Party to field um, their own candidates um, to win and not just to not just to protest? I do think it's important for the party to have its own candidates. and. Uh, the, the way communists run for office uh, is should be flexible, depending on the circumstances. Uh, sometimes they run as Democrats. In Washington state, we once had 12 members of the state legislature who were members of the Communist Party. And they formed, the. everyone knew that they were communists. They formed something called the Public Works Caucus. Uh, because they couldn't use the, the term communists as uh, to describe them. Um, but most of them uh, were elected as, as Democrats. And then, of course, it was the, came the Cold War and they were, they were attacked and driven out. Um, so, yes, it's very important for us to run candidates. We have a few. Uh, Denise Weinbrenner in uh, uh, Winesboro, uh, uh, what's his name, in, in uh, Western Pennsylvania. Um, anyway, she's a city council person, and uh, she is, uh, she, but it's coalition politics is the way she's won. Now, the candidates here are definitely not. They're not communists, but the enemies, the folks that are trying to defeat them, have called them communists. Why are they communists? Because Tim Wheeler has endorsed them. Now, as a matter of fact, I never said I endorsed them. I never said we, I endorsed them. I worked like hell to elect them, but I didn't say I endorsed them. But they're liars. They are not communists. And it's just a, a McCarthyite smear. Uh, I wrote a letter to the uh, editor of the Peninsula Daily News, who was just printed a few days ago, uh, uh, say, saying exactly what I'm telling you now, that this is a brazen lie by McCarthyites who are trying to destroy uh, their these candidates who are out, decent, outstanding candidates, but not communists. So yeah, it's a uh, it's an area where we've got to be. Uh, but I think it's a uh, to me a lesson that uh, the fact that everyone knows. I mean, I wrote a book, right? One the title of my book is. Uh, uh, news from Rain Shadow Country about growing up here in Clallam County and being a member of the Communist Party. I never hid my politics from anybody. So people read that book and they say, oh, Tim Wheeler is a communist. He's also a good guy, nice neighbor, guy who stands up for democracy. Yeah, also socialism. But uh, anyway, 
Well, that's coalition building. So Tim, uh, uh, let me apologize uh, uh, to those who still have their hands up. We've run out of time. And uh, again, we'd like to thank you, Tim, for taking of your time to join with us and help us to understand and grow uh, as it relates to our rural struggles and uh, even our own struggles, uh, coalition building and, and all of that. If you'd like to access Tim's uh, pamphlet, please go to cpusa.org and you can find uh, uh, the, uh, you can find it online, cpusa.org. And uh, I believe at cpusa.org, you can even order uh, copies so that you can have a hard copy to share with, uh, with your uh, uh, constituency. So Tim, on behalf of everyone, we'd like to thank you again and again and again. Just thank you for the work that you've done and, and helping us to uh, move forward. And I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Over 80 people attended tonight. Uh, so I'd like to thank everyone for, for attending and everyone will, uh, who registered will, will receive the recording. Thank you very much for a very informative class. Thank you, Dave. Good night, Dave. Good thank night everyone. I'm very grateful. Good night, everyone. Thank you.